When I was a child, I was slightly impulsive and somewhat misbehaved for a decent amount of my life. And I remember once I made a rude face to my brothers and my grandmother looked at me and said, if you make that face again, your face will get stuck that way. That kind of old thinking in which is contained a truth, if not a physical truth, but a moral truth. It's this interplay between actions and being. When we do something, it affects how we are, what we are, who we are. If someone repeats a good action over and over again, that action develops with ease and changes the person. If an action is bad, it pollutes and ruins the character of that person. What we do affects who we are and who we become. I have a friend who said, when you have children, everything you own is either lost, broken, or sticky. All of your possessions at some point fall into one of those three categories with children, and that's because children do not know how to exist in the world. They think everything is theirs to touch, and that washing hands is unimportant. And so parents, correct the children's actions over and over and over again. Honey, say please. Honey, say thank you. Honey, say I'm sorry. Why? Is it the mere action of saying those things that makes you a good person? No. But the habitual action changes the way that you live, changes who you are and who you become. Father Tony and myself went through seven years of seminary. There are many other denominations where you can go for two years, get your certificate, even do six months online, then you're good. But we, the Catholic Church, an enduring institution of 20 centuries, know that human character takes a long time to form. That word formation is very important in our lives, and it doesn't just stop at seminary. My friends of St. Stephen Parish, you have been entrusted with a newly ordained priest, a very impressionable priest. And as I said to my first parish when I arrived four years ago, What you do to me, with me, affects the type of priest I will become. And so if we priests receive a whole bunch of emails written in all caps saying everything we're doing wrong, we can begin to exist continually on the defensive. If you do nothing but praise us and act as if we walk on water, well, that can also go wrong, turning us in to narcissistic fools. When you receive a new and impressionable priest, you are to love him. If and when, in your case, when, he says something intense, you are to determine first if it has a truth in it. If it does, then you're to to determine, how does it affect you? Are the words of the gospel, is Jesus in the words that Father Tony is preaching? If so, does it call you to repentance? It's our job, when we preach the words of the gospel, to always give a message of hope, a message of mercy, a way out. Because if we truly engage the words of the gospel, they will convict us.
And so you're not to just put yourself on the defensive, not to just say, oh, he's just a foolish young priest from Denver. He doesn't really get our mountain way of life. He's just such a young pup. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. You are to ask yourself, is Christ present in his word? Moses, in the first reading, gave the law to Israel. And in doing so, he states, see how much the Lord loves us. Again, you parents don't get enough credit. When you correct your children, and especially when they make rude faces at you or go, and say, that's not fair, thinking that fair is they get what they want, as opposed to you correcting what they want so they want the good, so that they want what is most true. Parents, stop looking at your children. I'm up here. You are loving them at a time when they don't know it. They think you're unfair and tyrannical. You did not have children to be despots in the world. But it's precisely in correcting your children, in giving the law, that you draw their character towards virtue. The psalm for today unlocks everything. And the psalm says this, You sang it, but most people sing mindlessly. So I'm going to repeat it. The one who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. The one who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Now, this is Psalm 15. In Psalm 15, it delineates a number of actions. How we're to treat the poor. What we're supposed to do with charging interest. A whole bunch of actions of doing justice. But if you do justice, your life will stay that way. Just like if you habitually make a good face, your face will stay that way. We had a Jesuit spiritual director at the seminary who oftentimes said controversial things, and he said, the first 40 years of your life, your face is God's fault. How you look, that's his fault. The second half of your life, how you look, that's your fault. And if you continually and habitually rest in smiling, have a pleasant demeanor, are open in body language, that changes you. Action affects being. So what does the psalm say? The one who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Here we are in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle. We do things as Catholics like genuflect, like kneel, like bow our heads. These actions which change our being, they instill reverence in us and they help us to recognize the presence of God in our lives. I think Protestants who convert to Catholicism have a leg up on cradle Catholics. Because now that they're Catholic, they have the fullness of truth. But coming from different sects of Protestantism, they also do things that most Catholics don't do, like know scripture and pray out loud. I love doing marriage prep for couples. And this one couple I had in particular, she was a lifelong Catholic, very well-formed, loved apologetics. And he's an evangelical. And when I would have them pray over each other, the Protestant was able to say, Father God, we just come before you right now and ask you to give your grace, da 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 and could just freely talk with God. The Catholic's like, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. We Catholics 
need to know how to freely talk to God. We need to know how to cross-reference scripture. There's yet another psalm that unlocks today's psalm, and it's psalm number one. And so your homework this weekend is to go home and read Psalm 1 and Psalm 15 and allow them to unlock each other. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked. Again, don't do something. Don't follow the counsel of the wicked. Nor walks in the way of sinners. Don't do that nor sits in the company of the insolent, those who scoff and make fun of each other and judge each other, but the one who delights in the law of the Lord. To say, Lord, I know that you love me. By having your church proclaim rules around sexuality, around keeping the Sabbath day holy, I actually know that that's your love for me. But the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. Then we move into being. So you do these things, you don't do these things. This person is like a tree that is planted near running water. Now I love flying in and out of airports. And when you fly into DIA, Denver International Airport, from the east, There's a lot of cool landmarks. You see farmers doing their thing, but you see this river. Eastern Colorado is fairly arid, but you see this river and a patch of green that goes alongside it. And it always brings me back to Psalm number one. That when a tree is planted near water, when it's planted near the source of what it requires, It's able to thrive, in season and out of season. It doesn't require the stock market to be good. It doesn't require no calamity in the world to have peace. It's connected to the source of peace, God. And so a tree planted near water is much more able to thrive. One who does justice is like a tree planted near running streams. And so if what we do affects who we are, and who we are gives us the stability of character, this peace, then others notice that in us. And they should say, why are you different? He is like a tree planted near running water that yields its fruit in due season and whose leaves never fade. Whatever he does prospers. And so if the Lord is constantly nourishing us, if we are connected to him as the source of our life, then we are like this just man, this just individual. Before a man enters seminary, his life tends to be a little bit of a mess. Because in reality, we don't know how to live in this world. And so seminary, being this process of formation again, it corrects a lot of actions. It corrects a lot of actions so that a priest would be available. So that a priest would be charitable. So that a priest would be loving and approachable. Seven years of correcting our actions so it would change who we are, making us men of justice so that we would be good priests, changing what we do so as to change who we are. So too then the priest is sent out into parishes to preach change of life, Why? So that it would change who you are and who I am. 
The whole premise of being in need of salvation is if we do nothing, it's not going to go well in the end. We need to be saved from a calamitous end. Father Tony has been sent here by Archbishop and by God himself to bring you salvation. Not because he's pretty sweet. He's only kind of sweet. He's also a little salty. But he has been sent to you by God to preach to you words of truth, to get inside your head, to poke at you and say, why do you do that thing that makes you unhappy? No substance, no amount of zeros in your bank account, no anything can fulfill you except the love of God. It was a big, bombastic, kind of annoying guy that first entered Father Tony's life, that pulled him away from what he was doing in college and invited him to a retreat in which he did something, namely made himself open to the Holy Spirit. And boy, did that change the trajectory of Father Tony's life. When people enter into your life, to change what you do, it changes who you are. So that the closer and closer you enter towards justice, by doing acts of justice, you and I become more and more what we receive, the body of Christ, the Eucharistic presence of our Lord. And when we are that Eucharistic presence of our Lord, not just in the church, but also in the parking lot, and also in our various facets of our life, then we do exactly what the psalm says. The one who does justice will live continually in the presence of our Lord. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.